Uh, I'm Beth Colson, and I'm going to be moderating. Um, we'd like to um, make sure that people who have questions have some time at the end to ask those questions. But the way we're going to be doing it is we'll have you, um, people will be circulating, collecting your question, and they'll be gathered down here by, I don't see, I think it's a couple of ladies, and then they'll be collated together so that we don't end up asking the same question over and over again. And then I will ask the question, and if it's addressed to a specific speaker, I'm happy to have them answer the question first, but then I'll open it up to any other speakers who might want to um, answer or add, add to the, an the answer to the question. So that's kind of the logistics. Um, so anybody who does have questions, uh, make sure that you have a paper and a pen and can jot it down. Um, I would like to welcome you to the Managing Stormwater Protection Lake Michigan, Determining the Future Now. Uh, as a former state legislator in the area, I have worked with many communities on stormwater protection, but most importantly, as one of the people who lives in this area, I've also uh, worked on stormwater as well as Lake Michigan cleanliness and drinking water for almost 30 years now. Um, in 1986 was the first time I went to my village, which is Glenview, and said, hey guys, there's a problem, we're all getting water in our basements, etc. And then in 1987, just like in 2006, there was massive flooding all across the North Shore. And um, so with that, I, I really just want to briefly tell you kind of what was done in the 80s, because I don't know how many of you were, still, were here. But in the Glenview area, we were able to get the Army Corps of Engineers, the Navy, because it was still the Navy base, and the, um, the village to work together to build Lake Glenview, to build uh, some retention ponds all the way up to Lake County. And for about 20 years, those held on to most of the water. But guess what? 20 years later, a lot of development, a lot of other things happened in the area, and um, we ended up with another inundation. What I'm excited about tonight, and why I was really excited to be the moderator, is that we're once again working with federal, state, and local communities, working with everyone in a collaborative, cooperative me method to make sure that A, our drinking water and our Lake Michigan is still there, but also that our homes are protected. And so I'm excited, I'm actually here to really listen to all these speakers just as you are. And what I'm gonna do is introduce all of them at the same time, they're, I, I'm pretty sure they're in the right order, so we won't lose track of who's who. But I'm also just going to give you their name and their title, because on the back of your program, you have everything about their backgrounds. And rather than taking a lot of time out of our uh, short period of time here, I would like to just uh, let them go ahead and get started. But I'll give you their names first. We have David Rankin, who is the program director of the Great Lakes Protection Fund, right here. Uh, Bob Newport, stormwater specialist, U.S. Environmental Protection Agency. Joe Kenny, community development director, Village of Glenview. Joe Johnson, vice president of MWH Americas Incorporated, principal project manager. And Jeff Hunton and Abel Holly from the Illinois Environmental Protection Agency. And so uh, we're, we have a specific amount of time for each of them to speak. Um, and then uh, they actually have a timekeeper. I'm going to just remind you uh, right down here. And you'll get a one minute and a stop. Um, I'm not going to be that formal, but if you could try to wrap up within a 30 seconds of their stop, it would be great. Um, and then we will have, I hope, about 20 minutes for questions. So it's, it's going to be, a, I think, an action-packed evening. And look forward to hearing from everyone. And uh, David, if you want to go ahead and start. Thanks, Beth, and uh, thanks to all of you uh, for coming tonight. Uh, 
I really am delighted to see so many neighbors here. I, I, I live in Wilmette, and um, uh, I appreciate Beth's story about uh, stormwater in Glenview. We've lived the stormwater dream in our own home in Wilmette as well. And I'd like to, I'd, I'd like to for the benefit of my fellow panelists, uh, can deduct this time for me and attribute it to somebody else. Uh, see a show of hands. Who's, who, who's here that's had stormwater problems? Wet basements, uh, flooded lawns, all that great stuff, terrific. Uh, second question, who, who here is a boater and uses Lake Michigan? Also terrific, that's great. Who, who uses the beaches? Show of hands, terrific. Who wasn't able to go to the beach last year because of bacteria? All right, that's really, really helpful to know, thank you. Uh, in the next 15 minutes or so, I wanna do four things. I'm going to quickly introduce myself uh, and say a little bit more than's on the back of the program. Second, I want to put Lake Michigan in context uh, and talk about freshwater globally, the Great Lakes in particular. Third, I want to cover some of the vulnerabilities we face as, uh, as, a, as a community, if you will, um, uh, because of changes in our, in, in the, our water resources. Fourth and last, I want to close on a positive note and highlight some progress other communities have made in, in, in managing uh, stormwater. Uh, so let's jump in and get going. The uh, planet you see is the blue planet. The third rock from the sun is covered by, 70% of it's covered by water. Uh, the, what isn't blue on there is mostly white. That's also water. So we're the water planet, right? And, and, that's, and that's great, that's terrific, but guess what? Humans can't use most of it. 90% of it is too salty for our use. A key kind of take home there is it's the chemical condition of our water resources that restricts humans' abilities to drink it, use it on crops, use it to manufacture things, use it to cool our electric generation uh, facilities and other things. If we subtract out that 90%, 97% of the water that's too salty or otherwise contaminated for our use, that's what's left, 3%. 3% of the water planted is fresh water that we can use. Two thirds of that is, at least for the time being, locked up in ice. Polar ice caps and glaciers and, and, and things like that. Fresh water, fresh surface water and fresh groundwater is, is a mere 1% of the water planet. Uh, and the scarcity, the water scarcity is largely chemical driven, not quantity driven. So I want to start recasting some of the framework that we're going to be talking about collectively together to shed some fresh light on how to think about water. Pardon my speed, I've jammed about 20 minutes into what's gonna be about 13 minutes. Uh, with this remaining 1%, two thirds of that is buried. And although it doesn't show well on this, on this slide, uh, only one third of 1% is fresh surface water. The good news is that the 20% uh, of that is down the street. If you follow Winneka Avenue East and jog around, you'll end up in Lake Michigan, which with its four sister lakes holds 20% or just about 20% of the world's fresh surface water. A globally scarce resource happens to be locally abundant. And uh, that's a, uh, a theme worth spending just a couple of minutes on. Um, I said nearly 20%, it's 18% of the world's fresh water. That's 5,400 cubic miles of water. For stuff that's usually managed in acre feet, cubic miles is a remarkable dimension for, for our freshwater resources. Let's put that in context. Well, that happens to be 5.4 square miles. What does that mean? That means if you pile all of the Great Lakes on top of Wilmette, it's 1,000 miles high. You think you have flooding problems now? Try 1,000 miles of water in your basement. That's a big deal. It covers New Trier Township to a depth of about 400 feet. It will cover the entire United States to a depth of 10 feet. It's a lot of water, and to, who, and to those whom much is given, much is expected. The water that, that gets into the Great Lakes typically falls on the land. Some falls over the, over the lakes, but most of it falls on the land. Of the, of the near 300,000 miles of land and water around our Great Lakes region, that drain into it, picture the lakes at the bottom of a bowl, the bowl being the land around it. That land area is about 200,000 square miles. Every year, 
117 trillion gallons of water falls on it out of the sky. That number's been drifting upward, at least according to some of the experts that we at the Protection Fund talk to. And um, uh, that's, a, that's, a big, that's, a, that's a big number. When we talk to the near 1,000 experts that we've consulted over the years about how to think about water resources in this region, here's the story they tell us. That when that 117 trillion gallons of water falls on that 200,000 square miles of land, pardon all of the numbers, um, here's what happens. Where there isn't a heavy human footprint, 86% of that water is absorbed into groundwater. It's absorbed into the shallow, uh, it's absorbed into the first three or four feet of, of the ground, typically. The remaining 15% trickles off and goes into streams and rivers. Of the water that's in the ground, about 60% of that, or about half of all the water that falls, is used by plants and returned to the air. That remaining 30% or so that's in the, the, the groundwater trickles into those same streams and, and eventually ends up in the Great Lakes. The take home message in that, the punchline in all of that numeric mumbo jumbo is this, two thirds of the water in our rivers and streams has historically been groundwater. That's really important for two reasons. One, the water that goes through the ground slows down. It's retained to keep streams flowing in the summertime and, it's, and it doesn't wash everything in the stream out into the lakes all at once. Second thing that happens is the water that moves through the soil is uh, adjusted chemically by the organisms that live there. Some of the nitrogen problems we see in our watershed and others are usually handled by the time spent in contact with microorganisms in the soil. Now that's all different now, and I'll come back to how different that is in a minute after I talk about so how, how we use the other water in the basin. Uh, every year we use 14.6 trillion gallons for a variety of things, not the least of which is to provide drinking water for 40 million people. That is a big deal. An even bigger deal, uh, at least proportionally, is that companies put that water to work for the benefit of not only basin residents, but they cover 30% of our uh, uh, gross domestic product pardon the abbreviations on the slide. If we were to combine ourselves, the economic activity in our basin with the economic activity in Canada, we'd have the world's third biggest economy, most of that driven by or dependent upon the water resources that are here. But just because we have a lot of it, just because we, we can make good use of it, doesn't mean that it's all safe, secure, um, in fact, quite the contrary. There are two things happening in our region that, that make us more sensitive to poorly managed rainwater. The first of those is counterintuitive. It's invasive species. I'll say a word about that in a second. The second is um, uh, that water's moving around faster than it ever has before here. And I'll say more about that in a second. Most of you have probably heard of our friend the zebra mussel. That's the little guy on the left in the upper right hand uh, uh, corner of this slide, but they're largely gone. They've been replaced by their bigger, meaner, nastier cousin, the quagga mussel, who if you look in that graph on the lower right hand side of, of this page, now lives everywhere. The zebra mussels only live near the shore. The quagga mussels can live in 300 feet of water and do just fine at the bottom of it. That's bad news because they those guys do three things that make our lakes more sensitive to, uh, to, to, to runoff. First, they eat the good algae. That may not be bad unless you're a fish or phyto or zooplankton or anything else that would eat that algae otherwise. The other thing that happens when they eat the good algae is they leave the bad stuff. The blue-green algaes pass right through these guys and they remain unaffected. So it's, it's, it's a shift biologically attributable to these invasive species that are going on in our system. The second thing that happens is they allow light to go deeper in our lakes. Uh, uh, the bad algae we, we experience need two things. They need light and they need nutrients. You can check the box on light because there's a lot more light available in our lakes than there used to be. Uh, third, they make nutrients more available. And without getting really wonky on water chemistry, suffice it to say that in the gut of these mussels, uh, algae nutrients, in particular phosphorus compounds, are converted to phosphates 
which feed these algae. So the invasive species actually have made our lakes, our water resources more sensitive and, and more susceptible to perturbation caused by runoff. The second thing that's happening, and I apologize for the quality of this slide, uh, the folks in Redmond evidently didn't like uh, to pull this in out of a Mac. The, the, uh, water is falling out of the sky faster. We're getting bigger rain events. Again, no news to the people in this room that's seeing some of it appear in your basements. Uh, but, but over the last three or four decades, we're seeing you know, at least 37% more of these 100-year storms. If you're in New York, you're seeing twice that amount. So it's a, it's, a, it's a big, big deal. The second thing that's happened is when that water falls onto the ground, and this goes back to the comment I made about what's supposed to happen to water in the system, it's hitting either hard surfaces and moving off of them faster and not getting into the ground and racing through streams to the lakes, carrying all kinds of things with it, or it's moving about two or three feet into agricultural land and out the same kind of storm sewer systems that we, we have in the cities. Farm drainage has increased two to three fold in most of the agricultural regions in the southern part of our Great Lakes Basin. All of this means that water is moving faster, it's carrying stuff with it that we don't like, like nutrients, toxic compounds, sediment, silt, etc., cetera, et cetera. Taken together, you can't see that, so you can see this instead. Uh, taken together, this is what happens. We get outbreaks of algae like this outbreak in Lake Erie earlier this summer that, uh, that, that uh, where these blue-greens, even though they look fluorescent green, these blue-green algae produce toxins that have, that have in the last year shut down three community water supplies. You've heard about Toledo. You probably didn't hear about Ottawa County. You probably didn't hear about Pelee Island. Uh, but all of that's happening in Lake Erie. I'm not saying that's going to happen here necessarily, but these are the kind of sensitivities that those changes in our system uh, uh, are, are uh, the conditions that those changes are inducing. More locally, however, I'm sure you've all seen this. Cladophora, filamentous green algae washed up on our beaches that in our neck of the woods is largely an aesthetic problem, but on the other side of the lake, where the currents carry that material around and deposit more and more and more of it, it's killing, it's killing birds, it's killing aquatic life. It's giving rise to avian botulism and other toxic conditions that uh, uh, sometimes result in these signs being posted in our, in our neck of the woods, if not in, in Michigan as well. Um, let me transition quickly uh, before I get the hook here and talk about a success story north of this, in spite of all of these changes, our neighbors in Racine, Wisconsin, have done a remarkable job bringing the health of their, uh, of their beaches back. In 2000, the good beach in town was only closed half of the time. The bad beach in town was closed 67 of the 94 days they allowed swimming in Racine. The community got serious about it. They made investments in traditional concrete infrastructure, relocating their stormwater uh, pipes and the drains, and they put treatment on them to remove, pardon the technical term, the big chunks uh, that get washed off in rain events, leaves and stuff like that. But they didn't stop there. They, they went the additional step and said, okay, we can build constructed wetlands to slow the water down, to give plants and microorganisms access to this water just like it used to be. And in combination with these strategies and other strategies, that beach that was closed 67 of 94 days in, 2000, in, two, in the year 2000 has uh, received, I think in June, uh, a, a citation for one of, the, one of the country's best beaches. And they've done that 10 years running. They did it by a combination of, of traditional and new infrastructure and uh, have built an economic engine in a town that really needs one. Uh, if you speak to Mayor Dickert, he will go on and on and on about it, and I, and I will not. Let me, let me close um, with a couple of, of, of comments. You'll hear from some of the other speakers that our beaches face similar issues, and they'll talk about uh, what we're doing in response to that. Uh, but when I think of managing rainwater, 
I think the drainage is the biggest use. Managing drain water is the biggest thing we do with water in this, in this Great Lakes region. Uh, and we do a pretty bad job of it, candidly. And I'm not pointing fingers. I think that each of us has a role to play. Uh, when we at our home uh, decided to go off the grid with foundation drains and downspouts, it has disconnect from the village of Wilmette. Uh, we put that water to work on our property uh, uh, to manage gardens. Uh, I think that we should resolve together, and I encourage our, our panelists to talk about uh, how we can, can work to resolve the problems associated with water abundance rather than simply relocate them. So I hope that's provided some context. I'm going to stop there and uh, wish the next speaker the best of luck in finding the presentation. <laughs> Thanks, Dave. I, hi, everybody. I'm Bob Newport from US EPA. Uh, just give me a second here to close Dave down. So the, one of the first things I wanted to say is I, I've known Dave for about 25 years. And this is not the whole story on Dave. And if you want to hear a few more details, um, just <laughs> let me know, and I'll tell you after. And Dave's wife and daughter are here. And I think they have even more stories than me. Um, what I'm going to talk about a little bit is uh, green approaches for managing stormwater, and including uh, practices that we often refer to as green infrastructure. And that includes things like rain gardens and bioswales, permeable, permeable pavements, and green roofs. And the question arises, well, why do we need these green infrastructure practices? What's, what is the problem that we're trying to address here? And, to a large extent, the, the root cause of the problem is shown here on this slide. In a natural condition where there's a meadow or a forest, when it rains, most of the water soaks into the ground. And a little bit of the water goes back up into the air through evapotranspiration, and only a pretty small percent of that water runs off. But in a developed condition where there's um, a suburban area or a city area, <clears throat> uh, that relationship flips around and most of the water runs off and a very little amount seeps into the ground. And there's a common sense reason why that happens. It's the impervious surfaces that we create when we build cities and when we build suburbs. It's the roads and the driveways and the rooftops. All these things repel water instead of allowing it to soak into the ground. So in an area like this, what you see in this overhead photo, 75% of the land area is impervious surface, so that means when it rains, most of the water runs off, and it has to go somewhere, and it, hit, it goes into sewer systems and gets collected, and then we have to do something with it. And there's several challenges that are presented once we get that storm water into these storm sewer systems. What we want to do is convey it over to a nearby river or a stream or a lake and discharge it, but there's a lot of pollutants that are in that stormwater, and it's because when it rained, it ran, the rainwater ran across a parking lot or it ran across a street, and then it got collected in the sewer, and then it ran downstream. And, and so we, things like, we see things like nutrient uh, concentrations in bacteria, chlorides from uh, de-icing practices, all those things are in the stormwater after it's run across the urban surfaces. Another problem is there's just too much water. So if we are able to convey the water over to a nearby stream, it has an erosive effect on the stream channel. It scours the bottom of the stream, it erodes the sides. This is a photo of the north branch of the Chicago River, and you see that vertical cut on the side of the river. That's not a natural shape of a river channel. It's because when it rains, a lot of water surges through the Chicago River system and eats away at that river channel, and it gets um, degraded as a result of that. And then, of course, another problem of all this runoff hitting the sewer all at once is there's no place for the water to go. So a subject all of you are familiar with, we get streets that back up and basements that back up because the water is looking for a place to go. So the challenge that we kind of wrestle with is how do you take a developed area with these impervious surfaces and from a water perspective have it function more like a natural area would function and that's where green infrastructure comes into play because these are practices that increase infiltration of water into the ground. They increase evapotranspiration. In some cases we store the water and, and reuse it later. You heard Dave say his house is like self-sufficient. They manage all their own stormwater on site. If every single house did that, you could imagine how much easier it would be for the DPW to manage stormwater. 
So the most common example of a green infrastructure practice is a rain garden. This is a, a practice where you find a low spot in the ground, hopefully next to a driveway or a parking lot, and you let the runoff go from that hard surface over into the rain garden. And it's, it's sort of a depression that's amended with soil that will be loose and allow the water to go in, and it's, it supports plant growth. And then that water is soaked up like a sponge in the rain garden. And you can de design rain gardens so they look really nice. This, is a rain garden in Inverness, uh, Illinois. It's co-designed by the Park District and the Garden Club. And um, it's a nice amenity for the neighborhood, but it performs a great function. This uh, rain garden gets water off a nearby uh, residential area. <clears throat> and so that you get the usual mix of nutrients and, and sediment that are in the runoff. But when it runs through the rain garden, it filters a lot of those pollutants out before the water subsequently goes into the wetland that's behind those trees you see here. So on an annual average basis, um, green infrastructure not only reduces the volume of water, but it traps pollutants as well. Another practice that's common for green infrastructure is a green roof. This is a photo many of you have probably seen before of the green roof on City Hall in Chicago. This will hold and capture about 75% of a one inch rainfall. Uh, this is a different kind of green roof. This is called an extensive green roof. It's really light. It's, it's almost uh, like in a tray that you lay in. And it's an advantage because on almost any flat building, you can put in an extensive green roof. It's real light. It's inexpensive. And if you need to do maintenance on the roof, you can just lift out the trays. So these are good practices for that water that lands on the rooftops. And let's hold it on the rooftop. Let's let it evaporate instead of running it down into the sewer system. And when I think about cisterns, it always makes me think of the expression, what's old is new. You know, we used to capture rooftop runoff and use it for things. And in arid areas, we still do that. But here, it's not a very common practice. And if we can, the picture on the left is from Ryerson Woods in um, uh, Lake County. Uh, it takes water off of the roof of the building, and then they hold it, and then they use it to irrigate the planted areas. And on the right, you see an image of an underground cistern that captures excess water from near a sports field, and then they bring that water back up to the surface to irrigate the sports field later in, in dry weather conditions. Parking lots are a great place to think about green infrastructure because it's a big, wide, hard surface that's repelling water. There's a lot of water that runs off a of parking lot. So if you can put green practices in your parking lot, you can take that runoff and capture it and hold it before it goes into your sewer system. And it works pretty well. This was a case study where we greened up a parking lot in Minnesota and we reduced the annual stormwater discharge amount off of that parking lot by 73%. And then that, that example used sort of a green practice to capture the water off of the hard surface, but you can also create pavement that's permeable pavement. So this is a picture of the parking lot at the visitor center at the Morton Arboretum, completely impermeable or completely pervious pavement there. So uh, when it rains up to three inches of rain here, the rain that falls on the parking lot soaks in and there's a stone base underneath that absorbs the water and stores the water. No runoff at all from this parking lot. This is an example of uh, taking a street and retrofitting a street to, be to do a better job of soaking in water. And this is an image of a street in Seattle before it was retrofitted. And then this is the same street after it was retrofitted. I know it's a little hard to believe it's the same street, but you put a crown in the middle of the street and then you, you change from a curb, a raised curb to a flat curb, what we sometimes call a ribbon curb. And then you put bioswales uh, in the parkway. And so the water comes off the street, it goes across the ribbon curb, and it soaks into those bioswales. And when they did monitoring in Seattle, they found there was a 98% reduction in runoff off of that street after they put in the bioswales. Now, we're not going to get 98% reduction in Winnetka because the weather's different. They have a lot of drizzly rainstorms in um, uh, Seattle. And as you can imagine, a big bioswale like that can do a great job of soaking in water in a drizzly rainstorm. When you get three or four inches of rain, the, you know, that's still a little bit too much for those bioswales to handle. Here's an example of a commercial street that had a, a retrofit. This is in Michigan. That was an image of what the street looked like um, before it was retrofitted. The idea here was let's put some gardens in, excavate out um, some area lower than the street and allow the water off of the street and off the sidewalk to go into these planted areas. And this is an image of what that street looked like afterward. 
and up to about a one inch of rain, there's no runoff off of that street. And there's one section of the street that can actually handle four inches of rain because the garden is really deep and, and can hold a lot of water. And a side benefit from this project <coughs> was the merchants thought the street looked better. Not, not that this wasn't a beautiful street to start with, but um, you know, once it was, it was redesigned like this, I think the merchants um, thought it was better for business. So it was kind of a um, joke and appreciate this. It's a community development project and it's a stormwater project at the same time. The, um, another thing that we think about in some of our urban areas in particular is where you have vacant space between buildings, a vacant lot, those are good candidates to think about green infrastructure. And so we did some work in Cleveland where we, we designed green infrastructure on vacant parcels. And you can see, you can make that look sort of like a park, but it's a stormwater park. It soaks in water. And in fact, as you can tell um, from some of these renderings, you can take water off the street, run it through a little, we call it a runnel. It's like a canal that connects the street to the rain garden and soak in that water off of the street in that rain garden and, and use that vacant par uh, parcel kind of like a small pocket park to soak in stormwater. One of the other uh, things I wanted to talk about is that green infrastructure is a great practice and it can really make a big difference, but it's usually used in combination with a gray infrastructure project to solve your flooding problems. You heard Dave talk about Racine. What they were trying to do was give treatment to their stormwater to protect the beaches. And it was a combination of gray infrastructure projects, sewer projects, concrete, pipes, um, along with green infrastructure. And what I wanted to show with this graph here is what green infrastructure will do is reduce the peak amount of flow. And the peaks are what we worry about with flooding. The pipes can hold a very finite amount of water. If too much water gets there all at once, you exceed the capacity of the pipe, and then it wants to surcharge. The water wants to go somewhere, including your basement. And the green infrastructure does is it brings down that curve and makes it less pronounced. But it doesn't eliminate the need for gray infrastructure solutions. And one of the practices we see very commonly to help with flooding are, are detention basins. And if you drive around in the suburbs north of here and northwest of here, you, I'm sure you've seen basins like this. And what happens is you take the water out of the sewer system that's collected from the streets and the neighborhoods around there, and you direct it over to this basin, and you hold the water there. That's why it's called the detention basin. We hold the water there, and then after it stops raining, you release that water slowly into the sewer system. And this graph kind of shows the effect of detention. It, it shaves that peak off. It, you extend the time to discharge the water over a greater amount of time, and then you can let it out at a slower rate. And then you don't have that big peak. And that peak is what causes the flooding to occur. So if you can use detention practices, you can often um, alleviate flooding problems. And Joe's going to talk later about some other things that are being evaluated to, to deal with flooding in, in the Winneka area. And I don't want to go through too many other um, practices. Dave Rankin mentioned the, um, the wetland that's at the beach in Racine. That's another example of a green infrastructure practice. But we just wanted to sort of kick off some of the discussion about the alternatives analysis and means of managing stormwater with some of these green solutions. And Glenview has done a lot of work on a lot of different approaches for managing uh, stormwater. And we're really happy to have Joe here to tell us some about what Glenview's been doing. Thank you. This would be a good test if I can. Thank you. So again, Joe Kenny. I am the Community Development Director for the Village of Glenview. Uh, can I just ask real quick, by a show of hands, how many people live in Glenview? Okay, so if there's 10 of you here, I'm working. <laughs> Looks like we're at nine, so I'm technically volunteering my time tonight. Um, I have a brief summary of our stormwater task force process after the big storm events that Beth alluded to. Uh, we went through a process, and it was a very public, collaborative process. So I'm going to give a brief update on that. So a brief summary on Glenview. This is probably Glenview seen a different way than you've seen it before. Uh, the story about this picture is that a former member of our Natural Resource Commission hand-drew it, and then she left the commission, and we approached her about using it, and she, she charged us $100. So I use it whenever I can. <laughs> 
So Glenview has three major watersheds. This is the West Fork of the North Branch of the Chicago River through the middle of town. About 70% of the village flows to the West Fork. On the east end, we're tributary to the middle stem. And uh, actually, at the west end of the village, uh, there's some areas tributary towards the Des Plaines River. And then within Glenview, there's 48 sub-watersheds. So there's a lot going on in Glenview. Glenview was primarily built in the 50s and 60s to en old engineering standards. So there are no stormwater detention, uh, no overland flow paths, uh, limited conveyance, so pipes that were sized based on what an engineer recommended at that time. And, and that's primarily how Glenview was built. So 2007, 2008, what happened in Glenview? Uh, 2007 was the microburst, so it was a lot of rain, but uh, the heavy winds and so forth downed a lot of trees, power was out for days, and uh, so a lot of folks had trouble protecting their basements. And then of course, September 2008, the flood of record in Glenview, six inches in four hours, 10 inches total, uh, flooding village-wide, and uh, there was a open house right after that to talk about what happened and so forth and a lot of residents showed up at our police department and demanded quick local action. So just everybody here I'm sure knows what flooding looks like. Um, I, I was taught by our residents to never show a house in a picture at a meeting like this. So this is all roadway flooding but we had, we had house flooding too. So the Stormwater Task Force process. Our village president and, and trustees named 16 area residents to work with consultants and staff to uh, come up with a master plan for the village. And um, you know, what, what do you do? There's, there's limited resources, there's different impacts. So uh, the village president did want a well-represented group. So there were, there were folks village-wide. Eight lived in areas that had flooding issues, eight did not. Um, and, and overall, we hosted 14 public meetings. That included two half-day open houses. Uh, in total, separate from the task force members, there were over 500 attendees at those meetings. The task force took their job very seriously, so they had a, uh, a survey they sent out, uh, 355 responses there. So again, very public and active engagement. You can see in the box on the right uh, some of the tools we used. We basically uh, wanted to keep the community involved in what we were doing and, and get input throughout. So this is a long list, but uh, the, the task force charter was to gather and organize data, evaluate flooding issues, uh, prioritize a list of problem areas, establish the flood mitigation principles for Glenview, identify options and you know, flood mitigation options and partners, draft a program with feasible elements and specific action plan, and build consensus uh, to implement that plan. So you can see by this list, it was a heavy responsibility these residents took on and worked with uh, our staff and consultants. And um, our first few meetings didn't go very well, I'll be very honest with you. The, uh, the, a lot of public did attend. They were still very concerned that the floods were recent. And we had engineers, I'm an engineer, so I'm gonna knock engineers real quick, but we had engineers leading a group of Glenview residents. And so we spent a few meetings uh, Joe Johnson, who's up next, was one of our consultants, and uh, we spent a few meetings saying, okay, we put this matrix together, this is how deep the flooding is, your neighborhood's a 96 with a red dot, and this neighborhood over here is a 98, and then people that lived in those neighborhoods would, well, I'm, I flood worse than you. So uh, we really had an aha moment, and, and the residents drove this, and, and it was, we broke it down into flooding tiers, and tier one was sanitary sewage back up in the basements. Um, the stories and pictures from that, folks, uh, the, the task force quickly decided that sanitary sewer back up into Glenview, into basements in Glenview was unacceptable, so that was tier one. Tier two is over foundation flooding, so flooding over the foundation of homes where it could damage the home. This is by the area rivers, but also where the local systems, the impact is that bad. Tier three was uh, where roadway access was limited, so emergency vehicle access or access to your home was limited, so uh, street flooding, uh, beyond a foot and then tier four was all other flooding issues and this really helped set a framework for uh, mapping the village and, and using the studies and the input, input we were getting. So this map at this scale is not meant to be read but I can tell you uh, after we had the tiers established we, we used the modeling results and we developed this map we had one of our open houses and there was a lot of buy-in there was a lot of buy-in people understood why they were in a different tier than someone else um, so it, 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 you know, each tier had a different strategy, 
and, and it provided equity to the issue on how to implement a master plan and has really been the basis for the master plan that we're now implementing. So in August 3rd, 2010, the Village Board uh, approved the Flood Risk Reduction Program, that is our Stormwater Master Plan that the task force developed. Um, there's seven components to the master plan that may be hard to read. Uh, so the seven bubbles, the, the seven uh, categories, operations and maintenance, so uh, the systems we have need to be properly maintained and operated. Uh, going down the left side, regional projects, folks along the river, there's water coming through Glenview that doesn't start in Glenview, so regional projects would be necessary. Cost sharing programs, uh, what could we leverage where, where private residents could, could move forward with a project and, and kind of leverage that with cost sharing. Starting on the right side, the capital improvement program, building storm sewers, building detention basins obviously was part of the solutions. Regulatory modifications, so what requirements in the village's code could we change that redevelopment, uh, again, didn't make the problems any worse. Funding mechanisms, you know, now that we were getting a master plan in place, what funding was out there to help us implement the plan. And then the seventh one was a uh, subcommittee and some of the neighborhoods where projects are still being developed, we still do meet with, with some of those groups. So those seven components at the top, uh, we're going towards the three goals. Goal one, eliminate sanitary sewer backup in Glenview was goal one. Goal two, reduce the impact, we're cost effective on over foundation flooding. And then goal three was for all the other flooding issues, to uh, as we retrofit the village, as we reconstruct roads, bring it up to the current standards. And, and so that was really the framework of the master plan. And at that time, $125 million in projects were conceptually developed. So we have this roadmap, and we're lucky, I believe, in Glenview because uh, the recent reminders. So again, at the top of this list are the 2007-2008 the storms, but since we've adopted our master plans, there's been four more measurable events. So with the recent reminders, obviously it's, uh, you know, Mother Nature keeps reminding us of what we're working towards and that, that this is a big issue and uh, one that needs focus on. So the results in Glenview, since we've implemented the, since we've adopted the master plan, uh, the board committed $7 million on the night of adopting the master plan. Those projects have been completed, benefiting uh, 745 homes. Uh, last fall, the board approved another seven, 7.5 million dollars of local funds and we've secured about nine million dollars in grants and again so there's projects underway that will benefit uh, over 1500 homes and then the five-year plan that the board has committed to uh, moving forward on has another 1600 approximately benefiting parcels so if you look at the parcel count that's about 30 percent of the village so from the adoption of the master plan eight years later uh, after this plan is complete about 30 percent of the village will have been retrofit with uh, stormwater improvement projects. Uh, another result, the cost sharing programs have been successful. Uh, we've had about 400 participants, so there's been a village cost, but again, that village cost with the programs we have is matched by private investment. Uh, we have an overhead sewer conversion program for folks to retrofit their plumbing to prevent sanitary backup. We have a rain garden grant, so if folks wanna build a rain garden on their property, we'll fund half up to $1,000. Engineering inspections, residents can uh, use the village's engineering firm to recommend projects for their private property and then rain barrels. So uh, those are the cost sharing programs and the success of those programs. And again, I already highlighted it, but having a master plan, having a roadmap showing outside grant agencies that uh, you know, this, this plan has local buy-in, we've uh, secured over $9 million in outside funding and we're targeting another 10 million now. So that, that those are the results from our master planning effort and the uh, the stormwater task force process we did in Glenview. Thank you. I guess um, I guess it was set that you introduced the next person. So uh, Joe Johnson, he he was also the consultant uh, who worked with us on the master planning we did in Glenview, and now he's uh, can talk about Winneka. Thanks, Joe. Thank you all for coming out tonight. I hope we don't have too many baseball fans missing the first game of the World Series, but we, we appreciate your time 
Uh, I appreciate the opportunity to be here and talk with you a little bit about the work that I'm involved in in Winnetka. It's great to see people come together from different perspectives and talk about stormwater management in this way because it really is a regional issue. It, it, it affects all of our area and we need to think regionally about how we're going to solve problems. So again, I appreciate your time. Um, my goal tonight is to add a little bit to the discussion about the experience of the village of Winnetka, uh, the work that they're doing to, or the work that they've done to develop the stormwater master plan, and then some of the projects that they're moving forward with. Now I'll talk a little bit about the project that I'm directly involved in, which is the, the stormwater tunnel and area drainage improvements project. Um, hope to add, add a bit to the discussion with that. We've gone through a, a lot of background, so I won't belabor this, but I think one of the important things about stormwater management, as Joe outlined, is when you really talk about the fundamental objectives, it's pretty easy to get agreement, that people agree we need to protect health and safety, we need to limit the damage to, to homes and businesses from flooding, we have to protect our receiving waters, and in general, we want to become a more sustainable uh, region in terms of the way we manage our water. So I think the goals are, are common and, and are very easy to understand. People have also highlighted the challenges we have in this area, uh, particularly in, in some of the north, uh, uh, the Chicago River watersheds. Unfortunately, a lot of this area before it was developed was marshland. Um, marshland doesn't drain very well before it's developed. Uh, when you drain it and then try to, try to develop it, it, there are challenges there. So we have physical characteristics in our region that affect our ability to manage stormwater. It's very flat, we have low spots, we have dense soils that don't do a very good job of, of draining uh, water that falls on, on the area. We have unpredictable, unpredictable weather patterns. I mean, Joe's talked about what's happened in Glenview, but we're faced with a, a, a moving target, if you will, that we have to try to figure out how to address. Um, there are changing development patterns. Our communities have, have gone, uh, even the mature communities are, are seeing redevelopment, changes in development patterns that affect the way water moves, not just the amount of water, but the overland flow paths. And I'll talk about why those are so important in a few minutes. And then historically, there's been a lack of funding for stormwater. Stormwater was kind of lumped into public works and, and got paid out of the general fund in most communities. As we're struggling to deal with difficult problems, we're realizing that we really need dedicated funding sources to be able to make these projects happen and get them done. And over time, our, our approach to stormwater management has evolved. Again, we've talked about this, but in the early days, the idea was put the pipe in the ground, get the water in the pipe, and get it the heck out of here. Um, we started to realize that because our receiving streams are limited in their capacity, we needed detention. So in the 70s and 80s, we started building detention basins and, and reducing that peak, as, as uh, Bob talked about earlier. Then we started to realize that there could be water quality benefits and, and we started looking at what are called BMPs or stormwater best management practices and looking at ways that we could infiltrate more of the water, we could reduce the pollutants in stormwater and, and do a better job of managing it overall. We're now starting to move into the realm where we're talking actually about stormwater treatment. Um, the device in this slide looks like a, a standard curb inlet. It's actually what's called a bioretention filter and there's a box there that contains a media as the stormwater drains off the street, it passes through that media. Some of the pollutants are removed before the water moves on down the storm sewer system. So there's a whole new industry of stormwater treatment technologies that are currently being developed um, and, and implemented in different areas. And lastly, as Joe talked about, our ability to, to model and, and engineer, if you will, uh, stormwater systems has, has increased dramatically. One of the great advances we have now is the ability to use mapping data and understand not only how is water moving through pipes, but how does it move across the surface of the land? What are our overland flow paths? Those are critically important when we're talking about big events because very few communities have storm sewer systems that are designed to handle four, five, six inches of rain. When it rains that much, water's gonna flow downhill. And if we have homes and buildings in a low spot, that's where the water is going to collect. We need to be able to understand that to, and to develop solutions that help us manage water in those critical areas. So let me talk a little bit about, about the Winnetka plan. Um, the master plan was developed by, by a group of different consultants that worked with the, with the village on various aspects of the program. Um, it was really focused, the, the vision was around protecting, enhancing property values, realizing that flooding was a, was a real scourge, if you will, in certain areas of Winnetka, and they wanted to try to address it, and also to promote stormwater management as part of an effort to really have a thriving and sustainable community. 
There were a number of goals outlined, and again, these are pretty common sense. We want to reduce the risk of flooding, reduce basement backups and sanitaries who are overflows, actively participate in the National Flood Insurance Program. There are homes and properties on the west side of Winnetka that are in the floodplain of the Skokie River. Um, we have to protect water quality, and that's been a key element all through the, uh, through the master planning process in Winnetka. <clears throat> Excuse me. There's been a focus on figuring out how do we increase the use of, of stormwater best management practices in a mature community where we have very narrow uh, rights of way, have mature trees, established houses. How do we make these things work? Um, the village has looked at its development regulations and said we have to understand how do we make better development decisions so to help manage our stormwater. We have to maintain the systems that we have that in some cases are quite old. And lastly, that we have to have a funding source to, to allow us to move forward with the projects that are identified. So that's an ambitious set of goals. And the village laid out a really a comprehensive approach. And there's a lot of parallels to what's been done in Glenview. Uh, each of the boxes here represents a different aspect of the stormwater master plan. There are certainly capital projects identified. Uh, there are public education efforts. There are funding efforts. The colors on the, on the graphic are intended to kind of indicate the, the stage of each of those uh, activities. The blue projects are things that are in development. We're still working out the details of how we're going to move that forward. Uh, the, the orange or tan kind of colored boxes are those that are in, uh, in the process of being implemented. So we, we know what we need to do. The village is moving forward with those activities. And the green activities are, are projects that have been completed. So there are several capital projects that have been completed. Uh, the village has set up a stormwater utility, and they are now collecting revenue from the residents to help finance uh, the stormwater improvements that, that need to be made. <clears throat> so let me talk a little bit about one of the projects that's part of the overall master plan. Um, it's a project that I'm directly involved in now, and this is the Stormwater Tunnel and Area Drainage Improvements Project. This is an exciting project for me. But as an engineer, I'm a problem solver, and, and I'll be honest, this is, this is a problem. Dealing with flooding in Winnetka is not an easy thing to do, as, as, as the same is true in many of the mature communities here. Um, but the goals that were laid out for this project when it was originally developed were to limit the risk of structural flooding. So again, we're not trying to necessarily drain everybody's backyard. Um, we're trying to limit the risk of flooding that gets into people's homes and actually causes structural problems. Um, Based on the frequency of events that have occurred, the village made a decision to set a very high standard for this project. So they want to try to accommodate the runoff from a 1% annual risk event, what we often refer to as a 100-year event, but we all know it happens more than once in 100 years. Uh, but that's the standard that's been set. And then at the same time, there's been a recognition we have to meet the water quality standards. I think the village has tried to be very clear that the project has to be developed and permitted in a way that satisfies the water quality standards as they apply both to Lake Michigan and, and also as they apply to the Skokie River and the discharges on the west side of town. So real quickly, I'll go through a few of the factors that led to the selection of this project. And, and you know, why are we doing such a large gray infrastructure project? Why can't we just do the green infrastructure? Um, and there are a couple of reasons. One of the most important or fundamental here, this is a, a, a cross-section, if you will, elevations across Winnetka. So on the left, you have the Skokie River. And as you move east across the village, the ground is very flat. You go up over a rise as you get near Green Bay Road and the train tracks, and then drop back down to East Winnetka and then out to Lake Michigan. Um, the west side of Winnetka is effectively a shallow bowl. Um, there are significant areas in the west side of Winnetka that are at elevations below the 10-year flood level on the Skokie River. Um, there's some high ground, so the river doesn't come all the way back there. But what that means is the storm sewers that serve that area are limited in terms of the capacity and the way they can drain those low areas. The village has a pump station to help with that. But there is a real challenge in draining that part of the village. Um, the other thing that's important to understand here is that there is a big elevation difference, obviously, between Lake Michigan and Skokie River. It's about 40 feet. That comes into play when we start to look at how do we drain some of these low spots. One of the other factors I, I want to mention real quickly is, is uh, as was talked about before, we'd like to infiltrate as much stormwater as we can in this area, but this is a map from the Natural Resources Conservation Service who maps soils. And, and what this really shows, the, the dividing line between kind of the red and the green areas is Hibbard Road. Uh, the areas east of Hibbard Road in Winnetka um, have very low permeability soils. So as much as we'd like to infiltrate lots of this water, 
the soils, their characteristics is such that we're limited in terms of what we can infiltrate into the soil. So that, that affects our, our thinking in terms of how we address flooding in these areas. We talked about the fact that the west side of Winneka currently goes out to the Skokie River via a pump station. But as we all know, the Skokie River doesn't have unlimited capacity either. And in fact, the village, there's a, a strict limit on how much and at what rate the village can pump water into that river. Um, and so that limits the amount of water that we can put and, and move out of the west side of Winnetka to that outlet. Joe talked about the areas in Glenview that have a lack of detention. This is just a snapshot of part of Winnetka, but clearly there's no stormwater detention here. These areas were developed long before that, so we have no buffer. The water that falls is either going to, store in, uh, it's going to be stored in low spots on the streets in people's homes, or it's going to be conveyed away. And we have to figure out how to manage that. Our opportunities for storage are limited. There are some locations on the west side, west of Hibbard Road, where there's open space. Um, the Cook County Forest Preserve District has made a decision, a policy decision on their part, that forest preserve property will not be used for engineered detention. So those areas are off limits to us in terms of creating significant additional storage. Um, there are some opportunities for storage, but as this, this map shows, the analyses have been done, shows that we could perhaps create on order 40, 45 acre feet of storage in these areas, and that's a lot, but the amount that we need to accommodate the runoff from the 1% storm we're dealing with is about four times that. So, so we have lots of constraints that we have to deal with. So the project that's been, that's been put forward and it's in, in development in Winnetka right now is a relief storm sewer project. And there are a couple of points I want to make. It is a relief project and it's designed to supplement the capacity of the existing drainage system. So for routine storms that, that fall on Winnetka, the water will continue to drain the way it does right now. The water in West Winnetka will go to the Skokie, Road, or the Skokie River via the pump station. Water east of Green Bay Road will drain to the lake where it currently drains. The relief sewers are there so that when we get these larger events, the three, four, five, six inch events, that excess water the system can't convey can be drained from these low spots where it's ponding and getting into people's homes and conveyed to a new outlet. Another point is this is a separate storm sewer system. Winnetka is a separate storm sewer community. They have a separate sanitary system. This is not a Chicago system where sanitary waste and stormwater are combined. Um, that's not to say that stormwater is pure uh, and certainly has contaminants in it, but I do want to make sure that people understand that this is not a combined sewer overflow project. This is, is stormwater. And quite honestly, the pollutants that are in stormwater are pollutants that are there because of the, the development that we've done to the land. They're either coming off the roadways or coming off our yards from fertilizer. Bacteria is picked up and when, when the runoff passes over pet waste, it hasn't been picked up. So, so a little bit of the burden is on us to try to do what we can to manage that quality. So the key elements of the project are gray infrastructure, a stormwater uh, tunnel under Willow Road with branch sewers, that would collect water from these low areas and move it out to the lake. And then a program of water quality measures. It includes stormwater best management practices at the very local level, distributed stormwater treatment at specific points in the system, and then a water quality structure at the outfall that's used to capture sediment, floatables, and material at the outfall and, and protect our final discharge to the lake. So there are a lot of moving pieces in the project. I want to talk a little bit about the water quality management aspect of the project because I think, I think a lot of the discussion here has gotten focused on the tunnel itself. And, and while the tunnel is a significant engineering challenge, um, tunnels and conveyance large diameter storm sewers have been built throughout this area. Um, the engineers in Chicago understand how to do those projects. Treating stormwater is a challenge. It's a new challenge, not just for Winneka, but for our whole region. Um, as was pointed out, the majority of water that goes to the Great Lakes is stormwater runoff. Every drop of stormwater that falls in the state of Michigan goes into the Great Lakes. We have to figure out how to manage the quality of that stormwater. Um, I'm kind of excited to be on the cutting edge of this in Winnetka and be in a community where we're challenged, kind of challenging ourselves to figure out how are we going to do this, how are we going to make this work. So what this slide shows is there is a whole spectrum of water quality management opportunities and techniques that can be applied here. Our challenge as engineers is coming up with a plan that we can present to the village that is effective in meeting the water quality standards, which are, which are challenging in this area. And it's also affordable for the community in terms of meeting, uh, meeting the financial and the budgetary constraints that have been set on the project. 
One of the current activities going on concurrent with our, with our preliminary design efforts is water quality sampling. The village recognized after meeting with the folks down at IEPA early in the summer that we needed to get better data about what were the characteristics of our stormwater. So we've got four locations in Winnetka right now where we've installed automatic samplers uh, with flow meters where we're collecting samples and, and flow data. Um, we've had two wet events since the, uh, since the samplers went in and we're starting to get some of that data back starting to get a handle on what, what are the characteristics of stormwater in Winnetka. Uh, the village actually purchased these samplers because they realize that going forward, they're probably going to need to do some additional sampling in the future to monitor how projects are doing, how the BMPs and the other water quality measures they're implementing are working. So, so there is a real commitment on their part to understanding what's going on and how the projects work. Um, I know you can't read the list on the left-hand side of this, but there are a total of about 36 parameters that we're analyzing these samples for. Um, this is not a small water quality effort. This is, uh, um, it, there's quite a lot of details in, uh, including muskrats chewing through sample lines and lawnmowers running over uh, wires connecting our samplers to the rain gauges. But, but we are getting this data and this is, to some degree, this is a bit of the wave of the future. I think we're going to see communities throughout this region having to look at their, at their stormwater quality and needing to understand what's going on in their community and how they can address those challenges. So where are we now? Um, the firm I'm with came on board in the village of Winnetka in January of this year, um, and we're, we're tasked with taking a look at the concept of this project that had been developed. And we spent the first part of the year really doing that, reviewing the concept with a fresh set of eyes, reviewing the modeling that had been done, meeting with the permitting agencies, trying to frame the problem and say, is this, is this a viable project? In June, we met with the village council and made a presentation and, and outline to them that it is a viable project. There are some major challenges to be overcome in terms of both implementing the gray infrastructure and the water quality management measures that have to go there. Um, but we need, to, we need to develop those. We need, there are technologies uh, available that allow us to deal with a lot of these issues. We need to figure out if we can assemble them in a package in Winnetka that meets the goals in terms of flood reduction and water quality management. So based on that meeting in June, the, the village authorized us to proceed with the next stage of the project, which is basically preliminary design. So right now we're working to develop what we call 30% engineering plans. So this would be laying out the project to see where, where will these pipes fit. Uh, we've been doing surveying, collecting soils information to get a better understanding of what the project entails so that we can get a better idea of how much it's going to cost. At the same time, we're doing a water quality monitoring program and developing a water quality management plan to come up with a strategy to say how are we going to meet the specific water quality parameters that we have to meet, um, both again at the lake and at the, at the west side of the village in the Skokie River. Uh, early next year, we'll meet again with the village council and, and they have the opportunity to review our work and that's another decision point for them. At that point, they'll have preliminary drawings, they'll have preliminary permit applications that lay out the strategy and they'll have an updated cost estimate. Um, that's the time when they'll have to kind of look at this and say, okay, are we still, is this still the right project to move forward, take the detailed design? Are there adjustments we need to make and proceed with? Or do we need to go back to the drawing board? And that was the way that they specifically asked to structure our contract so that there were these opportunities over the course of the project to review what was going on and make sure that they were satisfied with the, uh, with the project that was, as it was being developed. So that's a quick overview of, of the status of the project. Um, I'm going to turn it over to our guests from IEPA and they'll be able to tell you a little bit more about, uh, about the water quality specific challenges that we have to address in this area and, uh, and then we look forward to answering your questions. So thank you for your time. I'm going to let you guys figure it out. <laughs> now that Dave taught me. Bob says he's an expert on Apple. so. Only because I did this one. All right. My name is Jeff Hutton. I'm from Illinois EPA. It's my contact information up there. I do return phone calls. I will return emails. If you have questions, please contact me. Uh, it may be, it, it may take me a day to get back to you. There have been times when I've come in after I've been on vacation or something and I find myself answering messages all day and I haven't got them done by the end of the day. So, I, but I will get back to you. Oops. 
how do I go back? I just went too far. I've got it. I got it. I got it. I got it. Okay. The, I'm afraid my slides are going to be kind of boring. I don't have any pictures. This is pretty much the extent of my graphic, computer graphic skills. Um, and, and I got a series of questions uh, from Junie Beck before we came down here that specific questions that she needed to have answered. Uh, one of them was, uh, what was the difference between an individual permit and a general permit? Because, you know, we're talking about general permits for some of the communities here along the lake. Uh, some are going to get individual permits. An individual permit is generally a larger project or a larger facility. It has very specific effluent limits or pollutant characteristics that we're concerned about. Those guys get their own permit. It's going to uh, be public noticed on an individual basis. Uh, we may have, then we have general permits, and a general permit is for a general class of facilities. Uh, for example, around the state, a lot of our small communities have uh, sewage treatment lagoons. It's a very simple system. They have the same effluent characteristics, same treatment process, and rather than, than spend the effort to go through and individually public notice every one of these things, we do a general permit for all, I think it's like 780 of them. So it just saves us from having to go through the, the same process 780 times. Uh, what we're looking at here uh, with regard to Winnetka uh, and, and the other North Shore communities is that if there is a change, significant change, for example, an increase in the amount of discharge into Lake Michigan, that's going to be an individual permit. Uh, if there are no changes proposed, that they're just going to continue as they have been, that'll probably be a general permit. Now that final decision has yet to be made by our upper management, but that's the direction that we're headed. Uh, we have three stormwater general permits in Illinois. We have one called the ILR, ILR 10, that's for construction projects. Someone comes in to do a new subdivi uh, uh, subdivision. If it disturbs more than one acre of ground, They've got to come in and, and uh, get a permit from us, and that permit will require them to implement a number of best management practices to limit erosion, uh, sediment discharge from that particular site. Uh, it could be an industrial facility. It can be a subdivision. It can be uh, a new high school or a fire department or whatever. Any construction project that's going to disturb more than one acre of ground has to get one of these permits. Uh, we issue general permits for some industrial facilities. Generally, these are permits that are aimed solely at facilities that are discharging only stormwater. If there's some pollutant from that industrial facility that we're concerned may be in the stormwater, then it gets an individual permit and it goes through a more specific permitting process and a more uh, intense review. And then finally, we have the last one, which is the one we're concerned about tonight, which are the permits for small separate stormwater Small municipal separate storm sewer discharges, which I say MS4 because it's easier to remember. Um, basically what we're looking for here is we realize that the urban area has a lot of uh, issues with storm water and we want the communities to work at, it to low, low, at the local level first before we have to come in and try and get involved. Uh, this, is geared, this permit is geared toward people that have separate storm sewers. A lot of the areas up here have combined sewers that are carrying both sewage and stormwater. There's a separate program for those types of, of uh, uh, discharges, so they don't get out of it. They just have to go through a different set of review, a different set of, of uh, public notices. The MS4 permit is going to have six components in its uh, stormwater management plan. Uh, public education and outreach, uh, and uh, public involvement kind of go hand in hand. A lot of that is simply to try and educate the public and say, you know, if you have some leftover Roundup, don't pour it down the storm drain, okay? If you have leftover oil, you've changed your, your oil in your car, don't put it down the storm drain. Everything that goes down that storm drain comes out somewhere. So we want to try and educate folks to uh, dispose of their household chemicals correctly. And, uh, you know, it, it doesn't seem like much if you put a little bit down yourself. But if everybody in the town is pouring stuff down the storm drain, then it starts to add up very quickly. Uh, illicit discharge connection and, or detection and elimination 
What we're looking for there are people that are discharging to storm sewers basically when they should be discharging to a sanitary sewer. A storm sewer shouldn't be discharging when it's not raining. And if it is, that's an illegal connection somewhere. And we want to find out what it is, where it's coming from, and we need to get it disconnected. That's what that section of it is aimed for. We, I mentioned before we have uh, controls on construction projects. Within the MS4 community, we want the MS4 community to monitor the construction projects inside that community. So there is a portion of this that will deal with the community implementing construction controls. Uh, the fifth one is, uh, is one that's coming on, it's becoming much more important, and this is post-construction controls. Uh, people come in, you build a subdivision, uh, you build a detention basin, and the developer walks away. Well, in Illinois, if you leave a, a detention basin in place long enough, what happens is it goes from being a lake to being a marsh to being dry land. It's a natural process that just occurs. So periodically, you have to do something maintenance-wise. You've got to come in and dredge it out and take care of it. Uh, same token uh, could apply to, to wetlands. Uh, we build a constructed wetland. It has to be maintained. Someone has to make sure that it's not silting in. We have to be aware that there are invasive species that can come in and do a great deal of damage to that system. So somebody that knows what they're doing with aquatic plants has to be involved in it and maintain that. And that's really what we're looking for. Now, there are some uh, design criteria for these kind of standards. Uh, a lot of it involves green infrastructure, with Bob, which Bob talked about. That's based on handling a one-inch one and 24-hour rainstorm. That's 90% of the storms we get in Illinois will fall into one inch or less in 24 hours. If we get larger than that, then you're going to overwhelm that green infrastructure, and that's where your gray infrastructure, your pipes, your sewers, that's when it comes in. So uh, the, the green infrastructure portion of this is very important. As Bob said, it lowers the peaks, but it's not a magic bullet that's somehow or another going to stop flooding. If we get a big enough flood, then it's going to overwhelm that, and you're going to have to rely on your storm sewers to get rid of it. Uh, pollution prevention is the last one. This is basically going to the city and saying, you know, city of Winnetka, we've told all your neighbors, you know, all your, your constituents, all your, your people not to pour stuff down the drain. We don't want you to do it either. So when your city parking garage is working with your vehicles, you need to take measures to make sure you're not losing uh, herbicides or pesticides or fertilizer. Maybe you've got uh, a salt storage pile somewhere. We don't want that being subjected, held out in the open where it gets rained on and suddenly you have salt water running off into the streams. So pollution prevention is aimed at the city itself to say, you know, we're making everybody else clean up their act. You, you have to be aware of keeping yours clean also. Uh, with regard, uh, this was a specific question that came up as, what happens when we issue the permit? How is that done? So initially what will happen, we'll get a permit application in, we will review it in-house, and we will draft up a permit. And then we will send it out for 15 days. Usually it goes to our regional office, and Des Plaines up here, it would be Des Plaines, but it goes to the regional office, it goes to the applicant, so that they can look at it and say, is there anything they don't like about it or they want to change about it? They comment back to us, maybe we'll change it, maybe we won't. It depends on what they're asking for. After we go through our review of the comments from 15 days, then it goes out to the public notice, and that goes out for uh, 30 days. And during that 30 days, we're accepting comments from anybody that wants to comment on it. It could be anybody in this audience, it could be uh, the Great Lakes uh, organization, it could be the Sierra Club, whoever. Anybody can comment on it. After the comments are received, then we'll go through those comments and review them. Is there something we missed? Is there something we didn't see in the permit? Is there some change that needs to be made based on outside comments? And we do modify those permits depending on comments. Um, US EPA is notified during this process and uh, they get to review and comment also. So there's a number of people that will see the comment, that will get a look at or the permit, will comment on it, and then we'll review those comments. Where is this notification posted? Uh, 
The applicant is required to post a notice, and this is specifically what it says in the state regulations and the federal regulations, in a prominent location on the premises. And we also send one to the local municipality, which in this case is kind of redundant. We're talking about Winnetka in both cases. But the municipality is also required to post a public notice. Usually they do this in their city hall or a post office or uh, uh, you know, some other common area of the town. The notice is also posted on Illinois EPA's website. And I would, I'm going to show this email address later on at the end of the presentation also. Uh, it will be posted there when it comes up. And I don't know when it's going to be posted. You may just, it may just be necessary to go and check periodically to see if it's come up or not. Uh, is anybody still writing this down? Or are you writing it down? I'm going to go on to the next one then. We, we take public comments. Now, we may or may not have a public meeting or a public hearing on a specific project. A public meeting is something like this, where everybody comes in and the speakers get up and we talk and we answer questions and so forth. A public hearing is a different animal altogether. That is a legal proceeding. There has to be a presiding officer. There's a court recorder. Anybody that wants to give testimony has to come up give sworn testimony, and it's all recorded and the transcript is kept for later. Public hearings are a very expensive process for the agency. Uh, we, we try not to do those any more than we have to simply because it impinges on the operating budget of the agency. So that's, that's the difference between a meeting and a hearing. Uh, comments, when we get them, they need to be cogent and technical, which basically means you know, if you, if you send me a comment that says, we don't like this project because Alderman X is a real jerk, well, that's a local issue, okay? But we're going to probably take that comment and say, that's nice, and we'll file it and forget it. Uh, someone comes in and says, I've been on the Internet, and I found out that stormwater causes Ebola. Thank you very much. That's probably going to go in the garbage also. Uh, if a comment comes in and says, we have a problem, uh, you know, we feel that the... E. coli levels can't be met by this particular type of treatment. That's something we look at and take into account. So be to the point, keep it technical, and you know, it, it really needs to be specific to the project. But we do review those comments. And in our MS4 permit that is going through the process right now, we are in fact going out to a second 30-day notice period because we made so many changes due to public comment that we felt we needed to read public notice and let everybody see it again. Uh, the comments need to be in writing. Uh, they can be submitted electronically, but the agency is not responsible for collecting and maintaining those electronic submissions. So if you send me an email, maybe it'll get in the comments, maybe it won't. But we're not responsible if for whatever reason your internet provider didn't forward it, or it got forwarded to the agency and our, our uh, computer network crashed and we lost it. So the only way to be totally certain that your comments are going to get in is to provide them in writing. And if someone that's really wants to, you can submit it electronically, but I would ask you to please follow that up with hard copy so that it definitely gets there. But we are not responsible for electronic malfunctions. Uh, after the comments are received, we do respond back either individually, if there's a limited number of comments, or we may do a responsiveness summary, which is, uh, which we did for the MS4 permit, where we went through and looked at the different kinds of comments and kind of collected them into one question and made a response to that question, and it was still close to 50 responses long. So if we get an enormous number of comments, then we have to do a responsiveness summary. Uh, the question came up, what standards will the tunnel have to meet as far as before we can issue a permit for it? The permittee is going to have to meet the requirements in the stormwater management plan. In other words, they're going to have to come through and put those six, six uh, criteria into effect. Uh, it's going to have to comply with the uh, E. coli standards that are part of the Lake Michigan uh, total uh, mass daily load study that uh, my colleague, Mr. Haley, is going to talk about momentarily. 
and uh, the permittee can't cause a violation of water quality standards. Lake Michigan has some very stringent standards as far as what the water quality has to be. And before we can approve that permit, we have to be assured that that discharge will, meet the, will not cause a violation of those standards. Uh, phosphorus is extremely stringent and uh, it will have to be met before we could approve this project. So with that, that's very straightforward, uh, simple presentation, and uh, if you have comments, I'm going to be here, or questions. Once again, that's by contact information. That is the EPA's uh, web page where the notices are published, and uh, I'll leave that up here, and, and people can write it down. And uh, thank you very much for your time. I'll give them a few more minutes. I'm, I'm here to set it up for Abel. So, or, you want to set it up for Abel? <laughs> okay. Good evening. Uh, my name is Abel Haile, uh, Illinois EPA Watershed Management Section. I'm going to give you uh, the total maximum daily load program in Illinois. Uh, the Illinois TMDL program has uh, uh, three parts. It includes the, integrated, the Illinois Integrated Water Quality Report, and we were going to discuss what is a TMDL and the TMDL process. The Integrated Water Quality Report has two sections, section 305B, uh, which is monitoring and assessment of uh, the water bodies in the state, and the 303D list includes all impaired water bodies. Uh, the Federal uh, Water Pollution Act requires states to provide, uh, prepare, and submit a biennial report the water quality of the state, and Illinois publishes this report every two years, and it fulfills the requirement of the 305B and uh, uh, the 303D list. Part of the assessment is to uh, find out if the water bodies are meeting their designated uses, such as aquatic life, primary contact, aesthetic quality, uh, public water supply, and fish consumption. And also to make sure the water quality standards are met. For example, we have uh, 0.05 milligram uh, phosphorus for inland lakes, and this uh, uh, water quality standards are set by Illinois Pollution Control Board. And if any water body is not meeting their designated uses, they will be uh, placed in the 303D list. Part of this presentation, I'm uh, including Lake Michigan TMDL. Uh, which was completed in uh, summer 2013. We had three parts in that Lake Michigan uh, TMDL. We divided it into three parts, just for geographical purposes. One uh, for uh, uh, Lake County area, Chicago area, and suburban Cook County. But all those three are in one report, and they all have the same uh, uh, equally uh, the TMDL program. The, 303, the 305B Water Quality Assessment Report is available on the agency website, and I have an example here, uh, Appendix B4. Uh, I don't know if you can see it uh, uh, clearly. Uh, when our water, uh, surface water monitoring uh, assessment uh, Biologists, they, they go out and monitor the uh, water bodies. They do have a, a support code, whether it's full support, uh, not, not supporting, or where it's not assessed. They will put on the, the um, suggested code. And uh, they will also put the uh, 
the name of the uh, the name of the beach, uh, what kind of parameters are not meeting the standards. The 303D list, Integrated Water Quality Report, uh, and the 305B, we hold a hearing at the agency, and once uh, we have the hearing, we have to respond uh, with a responsiveness summary, and uh, the report is sent to US EPA for approval. So what does it mean to be on the 303D list? Well, we have to develop the MDL based on the water quality standards. And also, uh, we have to do load reduction strategy. And high priority watersheds are always scheduled uh, to be in the higher list for TMDL development, such as uh, public water supply intake. They are ranked higher. And anytime we have a water body listed on the 303D list, we have to develop TMBL within 8 to 15 years. That means uh, no additional loading are permitted until the water body is delisted. Here is an example of the 303D list uh, when we have Lake Michigan in the 2012 uh, integrated report. The TMDL development was in progress, that's why you see ongoing. But in 2013, it was approved by US EPA, and the TMDL was uh, uh, developed with the help of US EPA, thank you, Bob. And uh, uh, right now, at this time, US EPA is also helping Illinois EPA develop Lake Michigan toxics for PCB and mercury uh, to address the fish consumption. So let's define what's a, D, a, T, a TMDL, total maximum daily load. TMDL is a calculation of a maximum amount of pollutants that can uh, be discharged to a water body but still meet the water quality standards or its designated uses. The TMDL calculation has waste load allocation, which applies to MPDS permit holders. Load allocation, non-point source, uh, and we include margin of safety, and sometimes uh, reserve capacity. If a municipality is going to expand at some point, you have to include some room for, for, for growth. So here is the formula. TMDL equals waste load allocation plus load allocation, and the margin of safety is the uh, uncertainty between the uh, pollutant and the, uh, the receiving water body. And the, the, the uh, reserve capacity usually, if a plant is expanding, they have to let us know that they have a plan in the future. That way we can include additional load into that calculation. The, the TMDL process in Illinois, uh, Illinois EPA hires consultants through uh, RFP process, uh, request for proposal to develop most of the TMDLs. We have a few small uh, TMDLs that we do in-house, uh, but the larger ones, we usually hire uh, contractors. And TMDL is developed in three stages. Uh, currently, you know, EPA develops uh, TMDL only for those uh, uh, parameters with water quality standards. But at the same time, we also do load reduction strategy to include uh, nutrient and sediment where, where we don't have water quality standards. Uh, we do public meetings in the watershed, just like this one. Uh, and we get comments, uh, Jeff was mentioning earlier, there's a difference between public hearing and public meeting. Where we have integrated report, we do have the public hearing, but when we have TMDL development, we have public meetings. There are three stages. Stage one is to collect information about the watershed, the characteristics, uh, model selection, uh, see what information is available uh, throughout the uh, water body in the past uh, 
few day, a few years, and uh, uh, also identify methodologies and reduction goals. Stage two is optional. If we don't have enough data, then we have to do additional monitoring. But if there is uh, enough uh, data, then we need to go to uh, stage three. If additional data is necessary, there are two ways to do it. Either the agency will hire consultants to do the monitoring, or it will be done by agency staff. Then stage three is the TMDL development, the last stage. Uh, it also includes model calibration, calculation of the loads, and also the goal is to bring the impaired water body to meet the water quality standard, so implementation plan will be part of stage three. Once the TMDL is uh, complete, it is sent to USEPA for approval. I have an example from the Lake Michigan uh, TMDL uh, to see uh, one of the waste load allocation for the municipal storm waters. Uh, we have for uh, E. coli 126 uh, CFU per 100 ml uh, counts of fecal units. Those are the one from the suburban uh, uh, Lake Michigan TMDL very similar for Lake County and very similar for uh, uh, Chicago area. The implementation plan uh, includes recommendations and suggestions for restoring the water quality so the designated uses and water quality standards are met. And we also encourage at this time the watershed planning committees uh, to participate in the TMDL development and also apply for funding, which is available through 319 or green infrastructure uh, in order to meet the implementation plan. Bob mentioned earlier some of the stormwater management, best management practices. We have outlined in here infiltration basins, bioretention, vegetative soil, uh, um, and uh, redir redirect runway from beaches. And we do have also in this implementation plan, we include the educational part of it, uh, about beach grooming, uh, waste receptacle uh, supply and main maintenance, and uh, also signage about not feeding birds because there is the wildlife also contributes a lot of E. coli to the Lake Michigan beach. This is my information, and this is our website. All the information I uh, presented here is available on our website. And if you have questions anytime, you can call me or email me, and we'll try to answer as soon as we can. Thank you. I want to thank all of the speakers for being really good about staying to their time. And I, one thing I forgot to do at the very beginning is to thank the planning committee from the various leagues of women voters for putting together and pulling together uh, this variety of speakers uh, from so many different levels of government. It's not always easy to do that. Um, I have questions here um, from the audience and I would like to, uh, I was asked to ask you guys if the PowerPoints can be put on the League of Women Voters websites. So, Absolutely. so they will be, I'm assuming the league is agreeable to that because they asked me to ask that question. <laughs> and so um, the PowerPoints will be available. Um, so I'm going to start out with a few questions. They're uh, addressed to specific people, uh, but I would like to then open it up to let other people answer. Um, and I'm going to just, I'm, I'm taking them as I got them unless they were a duplicate or a very similar question. Um, this is a question for Bob Newport. It says, after a new stormwater discharge permit to Lake Michigan is approved, what is the ongoing regulatory process for monitoring water quality of the discharge? Tonight, it, he would say that uh, uh, the E. coli standard, which is a bacteria standard, um, would be applicable to that discharge, and the discharge could not cause uh, an exceedance of other water quality standards, things like phosphorus, 
And so there would be requirements for um, initially to design practices that would um, assure that those requirements would be met. So there would be um, the Im implementation of some of the things you heard Joe talk about, like decentralized best management practices to filter stormwater when it went in. So some of it would be um, making sure those practices got put in place and that they're carefully maintained so that they continue to perform. And then there would also be kind of strategic sampling of the discharge to try to make sure that those concentrations are met. And that's a, a requirement that uh, you know, the details of how many times it would be sampled, how frequently, um, would still be worked out, but it would be representative sampling of the discharge. And then there would be oversight of that data. And if we look at the data, either Illinois EPA or US EPA, and the requirements of the permit were being met, then um, there can be follow-up measures that can be taken by the state or be, by EPA to, um, com to assure compliance with those requirements. So there, there's a monitoring piece, there's sort of a maintenance piece for the best management practices and, and then there's an oversight piece to make sure that the requirements are being met. Did anyone else have any comments about that? I, I, otherwise I'll follow up with an IEPA question that's uh, for Abel and um, I think she also, somebody asked for Dave Rankin to make a comment on this. Does the IEPA have sufficient regulatory authority to limit nutrients like phosphorus and nitrates from entering Lake Michigan? And then also, does the Federal Clean Water Act, as, as written, have sufficient protections for the Great Lakes? So I guess everybody gets you to answer that? that question. Yeah, go ahead. Um, well, I'll go ahead. I can try and answer that one. Basically, we have authority to uh, certainly to limit uh, the pollutant discharge from an effluent, in an effluent, rather. And, and uh, at this point, we do not have specific um, nutrient limits on stormwater discharges, simply because of the variability of the, the concentrations is, is enormous. Uh, depends on things like how often it's rained, how much, what time of inter interval there's been between rains. That being said, if we feel that there is a significant enough issue, we certainly can uh, establish effluent limits uh, we, we could do that if we uh, so desired. In the case of uh, Lake Michigan, what we're really looking at is that there are water quality standards that have to be met. And those water quality standards have to be met when that storm water is discharged. In that case, we're not really looking at the effluent as much as we're going to be looking at the lake itself and a sample will be taken when that water is discharged. And if they violate the water quality standards, then they're going to have to go back and take meta, or, uh, measures to reduce that uh, discharge of nutrients or, or whatever, whatever pollutant of concern. It could be uh, fats, oils, and grease. It could be E. coli. It could be any of the other uh, pollutants that are of concern. So, Joe, did you want to respond at all to that? Or? No, I think... Oh, okay. I, I just thought I saw you... No, I think I'm And then, do you want to respond to the, the, the U.S. I would just say that water both the Illinois EPA and U.S. EPA have plenty of authority under the Clean Water Act. Um, a lot of the issues that would be confronted are technical issues, like, well, how much monitoring would we do? And, and if we were using a threshold concentration for phosphorus, what would that number be? And so we have to work through a lot of those technical challenges. But there's plenty of authorities under the Illinois Environmental Protection Act and the U.S. Clean Water Act to regulate that discharge. Yeah. And Dave, did if, you want to? Yeah, if I, can, if I can jump in. Can you all hear me out there? Is this good enough? Okay. Uh, I, I completely agree with Bob. There's plenty of authority uh, uh, to regulate things in outfalls. Uh, uh, but there were three things I didn't say because of, of time constraints earlier. Uh, first, Stormwater is probably the toughest nut to crack. I think you said that, Joe. This is really hard. Some of the constraints, the constraints are less about legal authority and more about the technical challenge of, of setting the right targets and the administrative challenge of regulating that whole network of, of, of issues. So it's a, it's, a, it's, a pretty, it's a pretty tough nut. With respect to the Great Lakes, does the you know is there sufficient authority in the Federal Clean Water Act? Um, uh, 
uh, I, I think that's a different meeting, uh, and, and you know, I, I, I'm happy to go there. I think there's a lot of authority in that act. I think there's a lot of authority in the Clean Air Act, in the Endangered Species Act, and in a whole set of other federal statutes that, that uh, how do I want to say it, are, are latent opportunities uh, uh, that, that, that we can use, probably make better use of uh, to protect our Great Lakes. Uh, so that's uh, my comment on that. I'm happy to chat in the hallway with anyone that wants to explore that. The last thing I'd like to add on, on, on that, Beth, and just to, just to kind of uh, fill in something I skipped over in my presentation, uh, the group that I've worked with for the last 15 years is a finance institution. Uh, we're not a citizens group, we're not an advocacy organization. In spite of what the name sounds like, perhaps, uh, 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 we're, we're, we're not fighting the good fight on behalf of the resource. We're, we're putting capital to work for innovative solutions to Great Lakes problems. And one of the reasons I think I was asked to be here is that well, I may not be a particularly smart guy in any one of those things. The thousand experts we've talked to are all brilliant, and I hope I've channeled a little bit of that for, for you tonight, so. Uh, with, I, I'm with the Great Lakes Protection Fund. I'm vice president for programs. Okay, um, and that I think, were, those were the more overall questions. These are getting more specific about um, what the Winnetka Tunnel might look like and that kind of thing, and then there's some questions on some Glenview, so I think I'm gonna try to separate them that way. Um, and this is to Jeff and Abel. Uh, if the Winnetka Tunnel is permitted, will this create a precedent for all our other lakefront communities? Um, and if so, um, is there, are there issues of water degradation in Lake Michigan? I, I, these are looked at individually. It's not so much there's going to be a precedent. Uh, anybody can come in with a project and say we would like to build Project X, and if it meets the the standards that are in our regulations, and it can, they can demonstrate that they're going to meet water quality standards and are going to meet effluent limits. Then certainly anybody could potentially come in and and have a project approved. Uh, it's not a matter of precedent, it's just a matter of what the communities themselves uh, feel is in their interest in terms of controlling their stormwater. And, and you mentioned that one of the other questions relates to, you mentioned right now there aren't stormwater regulations, but there might be, and that was one of the other questions. There, what uh, would make uh, them be regulated? Right, right now, what, what I was talking about, we have received recommendations from a, a working group that was set up by the Asso Illinois Association of Soil and Water Conservation Districts and they are recommendations of how to implement the green infrastructure program that, that Bob was speaking about. At that, this point in time, those are recommendations. Uh, the agency has made a commitment to those, that group of people that we're going to begin codifying those into regulations sometime around the first of the year. Uh, it's a contingent on a number of things, uh, mostly including, you know, what resources available and uh, and who was not retired at the end of the year. So, uh, <laughs> and and also those will be posted just as any they, other they will with go, the 30 day comment period, et cetera. So anybody who would want to they go come. through uh, they they really go through a two phase uh, regulatory process. The first part goes through the Illinois Pollution Control Board. That'll be basically the technical elements of those recommendations. It will be posted uh, both on the agency and the Pollution Control Board websites. There'll be public hearings. We'll accept comment, or the Pollution Control Board will accept comments, and then they'll develop the regulations. After that, it's going to go to uh, a committee in the legislature called the Joint Committee on Administrative Rules. Uh, they will look at it, and basically they look at uh, the technical aspects, they also look at the political and economic aspects of it. They will pass judgment on whether, you know, whether they want to sign off on those regulations or not. So, and in both cases, there will be public notice, there will be hearings, and there will be opportunity for public comment. Okay. Um, and Joe, I'm not leaving you out. I just, uh, there's a, a few here. Um, but it, basically, they tend to be the question of what sort of outflow structure is planned 
for the Willow Road project, and I'm not sure if you can answer that yet because you're still in the process. Um, and where would it be, and therefore would it affect beaches, et cetera, um, private beaches, public beaches, et cetera? So the outfall for the Willow Road project, that obviously the reason it's called the Willow Road project, the trunk sewer basically is proposed to run down Willow Road. There is public right of way at the east end of Willow Road that extends down to Lake Michigan that, that is village property. Um, and that's really one of the few locations in, in Winnetka where there is public access at, down to the beach. So the intention is that the outfall structure would be there at the, at the beach. The conceptual studies that were done uh, last year looked at a range of different outfall structures, including submerged structures out in the lake, uh, various types of structures on the beach. The recommendation of those studies was for a, a beach outfall uh, that would include energy dissipation uh, and, and other measures so that, uh, so that it would minimize the impacts on the beach area. That's currently the concept that's being evaluated. Part of our 30% design is preparing concept sketches for that, reviewing that with the Corps of Engineers and the other permitting agencies, uh, and then again, developing cost estimates for that so that we can review it with the village council early next year and, and see if in fact that is the appropriate solution, the appropriate design for the outfall structure. Um, so that's, that's the concept that's in play right now. Okay, and then um, I just got a bunch more questions, so uh, bear with me for a minute. Um, and I think this is probably for Jeff and maybe Joe also. It's uh, will the Winnetka Tunnel permit application get credit or points for returning stormwater to Lake Michigan? And if so, could you explain what that means? <laughs> well, I don't know what they mean. Uh, we would, uh, we don't really give them credit for discharging a Lake Michigan. Uh, you know, we would simply, I don't, I'm not quite sure what the point of the question is. We will, we will review it and they're going to have to uh, meet water quality standards. As I said multiple right. times. So I but, yeah, can I, can and I, I jump? think Dave and Joe Everybody, might uh, probably remembers in the old old days the, the the water from the water that drained this area would go into the Chicago River, or, or all the water would go east into the lake. And we've reconfigured that some of that drainage, so a lot of water now goes down into the Chicago River system, and it doesn't recharge Lake Michigan like it did a long time ago. And so one of the um, thoughts about um, t collecting stormwater and sending it to the lake is, aren't we sort of taking a quantity of water back to the lake that was really there to begin with? And, and uh, I think that that's an important consideration, um, provided that it's good quality water that's brought back, and it's brought back kind of slowly. You heard Joe use the word energy dissipation, which means don't shoot it out like a fire hose, but let it out more slowly so it doesn't do physical damage to the beach or the near shore area. Um, but there wouldn't be any um, specific credit for that in, in terms of reviewing the permit uh, for the discharge. So, and this question kind of goes with it, and then I'm going to let you speak, uh, Dave. Uh, why isn't pushing our stormwater down the Illinois and Mississippi rivers as big a concern as pushing it into Lake Michigan? Kind of goes along with what you guys were talking about. And Dave, you might have some comments. I, I, I don't know that it shouldn't be, uh, Canada. I, I, you know, I, 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 I don't know that that, uh, that shouldn't be. I think the... Uh, uh, if I put my old regulatory hat back on and look at the water quality criteria and the water quality standards for the various systems, uh, the lakes are different and they have different sensitivities and, they, have, and they, they, they handle pollution differently. So there would be different considerations about where it would go and different criteria and different limitations and strategies. So, so it would be different. I mean, it's different to put it in a stream than it is in a lake. It's different to put it in a secondary contact recreation versus full body contact versus drinking water. So, it's, so there are different considerations in those things. And I don't think anyone is suggesting we treat them all the same uh, or that we, we lower the bar and let something bad happen in one place and don't let anything happen in another, another place. So I, 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 the scheme is such that um, there are rules that govern both situations. They just are a little different. Uh, 
if I can comment on the credit question, which I think is a phenomenal question, the credit for stormwater return, under the terms of a court settlement that regulates the diversion out of Lake Michigan into the Mississippi River, uh, there is an allowance in that that says no more than 32,000 CFS, 32,000 cubic feet, 3,200, excuse me, cubic feet per second, thank you, Dick, uh, can be taken out of Lake Michigan and put into the Mississippi system. Part of that is credited against the stormwater that used to fall and drain into the lake that now falls, drains into sewers, and drains into, into the Mississippi Basin. Uh, and I, I think it's an interesting question that if some of that were to be returned, should the Illinois DNR be approached by someone to say, boy, maybe that frees up some of, the, some of, the, some of that allocation under, under the cap. Uh, clearly, Mr. Landy disagrees. Dr. So, Landy so that's disagrees. credit for how much water we're allowed to withdraw from the lake. From the lake it's correct. not really credit in the sense of like the discharge quality or anything correct. like that. So, so I, I guess what I'm, I'm here, and you guys are talking about credit in the sense of how much water it's going into each of the systems, and therefore, um, are we going to, in a, a, an interstate compact, uh, have a, other changes, not just for the state of Illinois, right? Well, it's, yeah. it's, it's a little different. It would, yeah, it wouldn't affect it. Wouldn't affect it would the not compact, affect the compact. But okay. it, it might have some, some play in the Illinois DNR water use permitting scheme. Okay. And I, I don't know. And we don't have a DNR person up here, so we can't ask that question right. tonight, but we will keep it in mind. Um, let's, uh, we only have a few more minutes. I know I'm try trying to keep us to the 9 o'clock. Um, and uh, there are uh, several questions for, um, I think, Joe and maybe David, but anybody else can chime in. Um, they wanted to know, in Glenview, of all the more recent storm improvement programs, what percentage of these projects are enhancements to direct discharges into our rivers and streams? And did the IEPA require any testing of water or require a filtering process? Uh, no and no. Uh, <laughs> essentially, the, the projects, the, the real large projects that Glenview is moving forward on are detention in Glenview. So safely storing the water, engineering where the water's stored instead of storing it on roads and in people's basements. Okay. And um, I think this is, uh, uh, wait a minute, uh, somebody else could have answered that. David, did you have any? No. Okay. Um, and I think, uh, Joe, I think this is to you too. Can, can you speak to incentives beyond rain garden and rain barrel cost sharing and giveaways that have induced the public to install more green sustainable stormwater management systems? And actually, that's probably several co people. In, in Glenview, uh, it's an interesting question. So, uh, the, the, um, obviously, we encouraged rain gardens through our Natural Resources Commission for a few years, and it, it was very slow going. So, we, we found that the grant program incented people to do it, and we've had success. Again, uh, MWRD provides very cheap rain barrels. We went and picked them up and sell them at cost in Glenview. Uh, it, it's interesting on green infrastructure. I think it's important to keep talking about it. We came up with a rain garden, rain garden public project for a road in Glenview, and the residents overwhelmingly were against it. They didn't like the look of that in their front yard. So I think the use of green infrastructure in Glenview, uh, we're, we're trying to get buy-in from the, the private side, residents taking the lead. Um, th there's still some work to be done. Did you have any more to Bob? Or, no. You already spoke about it all the time. Okay. So the last question here is for Dave Rakin, uh -oh. and is why are the locks in Wilmette still open from time to time? Isn't the deep tunnel meant to solve the problem? And what are the long-term plans to prevent contamination, contaminated water discharge into Lake Michigan through these locks? Wow. Wow. We end up we end on we end on an easy one. Yeah, uh, right. I'm going to look to my colleagues and perhaps some of you in the audience to help me with this. The, the 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 first one I think is relatively simple. And Joe, you said it earlier. Sometimes there's just too much water, uh, and and the the. Uh, uh, if the w locks in Wilmette are not open, I can see a scenario where they're overtopped. 
And uh, that, that, that isn't what we want. We don't want those structures to be over top. We don't want uh, those kind of control structures to fail. Uh, the river system, including the North Shore Channel, is remarkably sensitive to rainfall. It's remarkably sensitive. If, you, you know, if you're a water geek like me, you actually seek out the opportunity to be on the water in rain events, and it's, uh, it's, it's, a, it's a thrill ride. Those levels can fluctuate greatly. Sometimes they have to be open, and um, uh, the engineers in the group can go on at length about network effects and congestion in the system and all of that. But it, but uh, uh, that's that's the reason why. Was the tunnel created to solve that problem? It's created to make it better, and it probably has. Is it done yet? No. 2029 is the last date I've heard publicly, anyway. 2029 is 20, when it's going to be finished finally. Uh, okay. Is the date where all the reservoir capacity comes online. So uh, it, it still remains a work in progress. And Beth, I will confess, I've forgotten the last part oh. of that question. Well, and is, did anyone else have any other comments on the deep well, tunnel? I, I think it's important to you know, pick up on what Dave said, that it, if the locks weren't open, somebody would be underwater, you know, and it wouldn't be very clean water. Um, and so it's an it's a emergency relief of a system that's completely overloaded. To the extent we can implement measures like you heard Joe talk about detention, they're trying to strategically put detention around in Glenview that, um, that helps hold some of that water back. And if you put enough of that scattered around and lots of people put in uh, rain gardens and, and rain barrels at their houses and we implement measures, you can start to reduce the, how much of that water is hitting the stream. It, in, in, at the same time, and you can reduce maybe the frequency of having to open those. But it's it's just a matter of there's just massive quantities of water, and it, it needs to be able to go somewhere. Well, thank you. And I, I, we have reached nine o'clock. I, 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 there are at least twenty more questions, and they're all um, fairly similar. Um, but I also want to thank I want to thank you all for for coming and uh, being uh, such an attentive audience, but also for our speakers for. Uh, bringing forward the ideas, uh, collaboration and coordination. There is a lot more chance for public hearings, obviously, as these, as projects and communities move forward. Oh, I can't forget the drawing for a rain barrel. By the way, I have two. All my roof rainwater goes into my rain barrel. I didn't have to water at all the last three summers because of my rain barrels. Okay, so who wants to be the, who wants to draw a name? Dave, you do it. This is for the rain barrel. Uh, Christine Van Dornick. Congratulations. And we only have one, right? Anyways, you can, uh, uh, you can go to the Chicago Garden Show. They sell them there. They're not too expensive. But you do have to have somebody help you put them in, because they don't always work if you do it yourself. <laughs> but. Um, I really appreciate the planning committee for putting this together. Uh, so many of the other questions are really very specific questions um, related to speakers. And if any of you are willing to stay for a little bit, people may have some other questions. And thank you very much. <laughs>